Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, Kubernetes community meeting. Hope you're all having a fantastic week. Um, before we start the meeting here, uh, we do have a code of conduct. This is recorded and streamed, so make sure you don't say or do anything that you don't want permanently recorded. Uh, this is a, a kind of a special community meeting. Uh, we're going to do a Kubernetes 1.15 release retrospective. So this community meeting is all about the, the new release and the retro for that release. Uh, we do have a moderator uh, today, Christine. So I'm going to hand it over to Christine. Yeah, um, uh, thanks for the intro. Um, just in case, um, if, um, I'm, I'm new to the community. My name's Christine. Um, I work at Leonard and I'm a technical project manager there. And um, yeah, I think uh, let's get started. So um, just to, I'm not going to share my screen, but um, everyone has the link. I dropped it in the, in the chat. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a previous retro follow-up and then go over um, what went well, uh, what could have gone better. Um, I know some of the things uh, I saw in the chat, um, especially around the delay, and then what things you could do differently for, for 116 and beyond. So um, without further ado, let's jump right into it. Um, so some of the, uh, I'll, just, I'll just read some of these off um, uh, because I don't think the, from the previous retro, there was any action items um, or assignees to the action items, but um, actually, Aaron, are you, are you there? I think uh, yeah. you want to read the first one? I can, yeah. I can speak to a couple of these just as a reminder. I think these are great therapy and vent sessions for us as a community, but I think they're even better if we can decide like actual things to do and then follow up on those. So I like to go back and see if we did what we said we were going to do. Uh, nobody assigned themselves action items last time, uh, so mea culpa, I'm not doing that myself. I've done that for the past couple of retros. One thing I personally followed through to completion was ensuring that we do actually have owners for all of the release blocking jobs. This was done by making sure that everybody has an email address associated with their uh, jobs, and Test Grid sends out alerts if those jobs fail. If you're on the release team, you've definitely been seeing those alerts. Uh, but if you're on like SIG networking or SIG scalability, you've also been seeing those alerts. Uh, some of the suggested changes that came up uh, didn't have super clear owners, but I just wanted to give some shouts out to people for like putting in the work and following up. Uh, Maria Natala has been working diligently to sort of help consolidate all of the different jobs across the different secretly stoned dashboards. And thanks to some of Maria's work, uh, some of mine and some of Catherine's work, we now sort of automatically generate all of those dashboards and are working to gradually like reduce the set of things that people have to look at to understand if the release is healthy or not. Um, Jeff, as I'm sure we'll talk about later, put together a cap about how to improve the release notes process and make it uh, much better and also actually about the release instead of a bunch of other random things. So that cap got merged and has since been implemented and used actively in this release. Um, Nico Panderas, uh, talked about a number of ideas, uh, a number of ideas to sort of improve our workflow, as, of, uh, sort of come up with some kind of like organization-wide uh, triaging workflow that could be used by the release team or individual SIGs. Discussion for that uh, is still kind of ongoing. Um, most recently, I saw some discussion about this in uh, contributor experience. I think it's also been discussed in SIG release. Um, so and then- most yeah, so the most recent discussion about that was in SIG uh, ContribX. Nico is going to be working on a cap around uh, implementing a few of the, uh, the, uh, the bot and label features for that. So. Um, one sort of tiny part of that that Nikita has picked up and started implementing as a Prow plugin is something that will automatically add the most appropriate milestone uh, to PRs uh, when they merge. Uh, so that you, it's, I, I think uh, I heard Jordan Liggett sort of went back and retrospectively added the milestone to a number of PRs that he worked on to like really help him understand, hey, like when this PR merged, like what release did it actually land in? So ensuring the milestone is added to PRs every time they merge will really help us quickly answer those sorts of questions. Um, areas where I saw we talked about things, but I didn't actually see any progress this release cycle, though please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Hannes uh, put together a number of caps around improving the state of packaging and trying to have it defined in like maybe one place instead of five. Um, and there was a cap uh, put forth for that, but it was not staffed or implemented as of yet. 
Um, we also discussed a number of frustrations and issues with uh, everybody using CAPS for, for things um, and the sheer volume of like manual labor and work involved in improving that process or maybe simplifying or reducing the amount of toil uh, involved there. I didn't personally see any specific things uh, happen with regard to that. So with regards to uh, packaging, um, so Tim and I have been discussing uh, what to do with packaging uh, quite a bit over the last few days. Um, so moving into the 116 release cycle, what we're trying to do is make sure that you can build DEBs and RPMs for uh, individual versions for all versions of the uh, individual packages, so kubeadm, kubelet, Cube kubectl, uh, Kubernetes CNI, and uh, CRI tools um, on any version, on any architecture, uh, for any distro, for any channel. Right. So that work is active. We have a few PRs up um, that I've linked around in the channels, but I can link them here. Um, with regards to the kept stuff, um, the kept stuff, I think one of the next things that we need to do is um, metadata validation for the caps. Um, so that is on the board. Um, I can link the board as well. Uh, with regards to some of the things that need to be done around caps, one of the biggest things that I see is uh, that caps, there are some caps that have been open since November, December, right? That needs to change. Um, there's, I think there's still a problem around merging early and iterating often on caps. So one quick suggestion would be to add a an open questions uh, part of a cap, right? So we can just capture the feedback from whatever review process and move forward. At least we don't lose that across GitHub comments, right? So. So um, you're saying the, to add open questions and the camp the kept template template itself, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. I'll add that as an action. And Steven said something you can you can do? Yep. Okay. And I had a quick question on the work, uh, Steven, that you and Tim are doing around packaging. Does that implement the caps put forth by Hannes around improving the state of packaging? Or is this so yet another different way of doing releases? It's, it is not a different way of doing releases, it's the current way of doing releases. So it's iterative improvements on the things that we have right now, right? The, the, some of the stuff that Hannes is writing up, and some of the stuff that um, people have been talking about in across release and cluster lifecycle are like grand visions for the problems, right? So what we're trying to do is find some iterative improvements to the tooling that we have today. Right, and then while while also talking about the grand vision for that, so look for look for updates to those caps moving into one sixteen as well. Okay, I've been involved in at least some of the PRs that Tim has put forth, and it was I hadn't yet found my way to like an umbrella issue or some central source of truth for like what the plan was for that work. So if you can tie back to those caps, that'd be cool. Yep. Um, and Christine, I will hand it off to you, and I will be quiet now. <laughs> okay. Um... So I think that's it on the uh, previous retro follow-up. Um, uh, so let's jump into what went well. Um, so it looks like Cheryl, you're up first. Are you on the call? Hi, yep, I am. Um, so just wanna give a shout out to Josh if he's here for you know organizing and managing shadow-related things. So that I feel like that went well, and I hope he stays on as um, emeritus or someone, you know, maybe take over his position. Or maybe he should have shadows and then someone, um, you know, takes over his role. <laughs> um, yeah, that's pretty much what I want to say and what went well. Um, oh, yes. And also, we had a special channel just for release engineering or release management re related. Um, discussions and I think that's um, much better than just having it in SIG release because there's also other conversations happening there and you know conversations get gets cut off between different contexts or different topics so that was nice having our own um, channel yeah uh, plus I mean plus one to that you know Cheryl thanks for the idea and thanks for like actually working to get it implemented um, 
Catherine, thank you for actually having Slack infra automation so that that was super easy to do. Um, if anyone is interested in like seeing what our release process was for 115, you can actually go to release managers and watch all of our chatter. Previously, um, this has been kind of back channel DMs between people uh, who have power to push the packages um, and uh, across a bunch of different, uh, across a bunch of DMs, uh, across a bunch of different emails. So it's nice to see that everything is kind of coalesced into one channel. Yep, I totally agree with that. I found it really um, confusing, especially coming in as being new for the role. So that really helped. Great. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, is that is that something that was like a private channel, or and, and this is the the first time it happened, or? So. Oh, it, um, I was just going to say it's not a private channel. So. Okay. Yeah. No. Bef before there were was no channel, so if you needed to ping someone about creating packages or something, you would ping them individually, and that, you know, that message would be wherever it was, yeah. right? Um, going back really quickly to the, the Emeritus Advisor, um, Emeritus Advisor, um, the kind of the goal, and, and thank you, Josh, for doing it for the last few cycles, but one of the goals is that, you know, we spun up the release team sub project officially, right? The release team has always existed, but did not have a set of consistent sub project owners. What we did this cycle was move the set of uh, N minus three, I think, uh, or N minus four uh, release team leads as sub project owners. So there's a consistent body of expertise uh, across across the release team. So since we change we change uh, you know uh, ownership uh, essentially every release cycle, we thought it was important to have a consistent body of people who knew about the release cycle, right? So the the sub project owners for the release team sub project are former release team leads, right? So Josh is one of them, and Josh became uh, Emeritus Advisor for uh, the last few cycles. What we'd like to see is a rotation of those uh, those previous release team leaders coming back to say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna check it out one more time and see how how things are going and help people along in the process. So that's kind of the goal for that. Cool. Um, great. All right, um, moving along. Uh, I think this is, is this Josh? I'm sorry, forgive me for, uh, uh, I'm not familiar with all the like Slack handles and stuff. <clears throat> Jay Burkus. Yeah, that's me. Oh, um, yeah. So two of the things we were able to accomplish, having somebody separate who was in charge of the shadows. This, <clears throat> prior to adding the A position, the release lead was also in charge of all of the shadow stuff except that de facto <clears throat> on a couple of the releases, Stephen Augustus actually did it. So having an official position that was not the release lead that was in charge of shadows and succession and that sort of thing allowed us to do two things that um, we wanted to do for a while but had not been able to accomplish. One was to select the shadows earlier. Um, that is to have all the shadows selected by the time we were like 10 days into the release cycle, which meant that um we didn't have this sort of three week period where we were theoretically in a new release cycle but the team wasn't staffed up um and we're going to continue that for 116 the shadow application is already open um will be open through tomorrow and then uh, i'll be selecting next week um, <coughs> um we're also able to make sure that all role handbooks um, and a whole bunch of people across the team contributed to this to make sure that all role handbooks had lead and shadow requirement sections in the role handbook so that when people are wanting to join the release team, they know what they're committing to. Aaron, uh, you have some comments? Yes. Uh, actually, timely selection of shadows was something else that came up as a result of the 114 retro. So I wanted to thank. Josh for following up on that. Um, to, to clarify some things, part of the awkwardness in shadow selection for the previous release cycle was that it started after the holidays in KubeCon and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it's something we should be mindful of as we consider the rotation from 
Q4 to Q1 if we continue to be on a quarterly release schedule by the time that rolls around. Um, and I also wanted to give a huge thanks to Stephen for effectively filling the role of like shadow coordinator while uh, uh, while I was coming in as the release lead for 114 because it's really difficult. Like shadow selection sort of starts about three weeks prior to the release going out the door, which anybody involved in the release will tell you is a very uh, attention grabbing time uh, that the release lead can't necessarily focus on a whole bunch of things. So choosing somebody to explicitly delegate to for the selection process has been hugely helpful. I think the biggest change here is to have that person then follow through through the entire release cycle to make sure that shadow stuff is going well. So it's super important to have one team, like one person kind of focused on the succession plan almost so that the current release lead can focus on getting the release out the door. So just mentioning that while it's good to have that one person, I, I think to build up the shadow team, remember that as any any release team, any 116 uh, release members coming into this, remember that as a lead, part of your job is to help mentor your shadows. So you should be doing that actively throughout the cycle. Um, okay. Uh, so I think we left off with um, Jeff. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I would just like to point out that we made a plan to spin up a separate release notes website for the change log. We mm -hmm. implemented it. It went live without a hitch and that was kind of awesome and much Ooh. props to Sasha and Lindsay for kicking butt. Uh, especially Sasha. He did so much work. Uh, yeah, that's it. Awesome. Um, next up, I think uh, this is Tim, right? Yes. Yep, that's right. Yeah, I just wanted to, to note that it seemed like this cycle, based on top of prior cycles documentation update, leads were generally able to know what they were doing at any point in time. And as we had occasional questions come up, we could say, I'm pretty sure that's in the handbook. And generally it was where there was some bit of clarification needed. The lead proactively on the spot made a PR and made the doc more clear. So I feel like we're doing pretty good on, on getting away from that tribal knowledge versus having it written down. Yeah. Obviously the, the next step as Aaron always says is to automate the things now that we know who we are. Yep. Um, yep. So, Again, leads, shadows, everyone coming into the 116 cycle. Remember that the role handbooks are living documents, right? So everything that you're reading in a role handbook, question it. Feel free to question it. Feel free to make changes on it. If it doesn't, like, if the process doesn't work, if it feels awkward, if it's something that can be automated, write it down. Like, make it, make an issue, make an action plan to to fix it. Great. Um, okay. So, um, anything else uh, before we move on to the next section on, on what went well in uh, 115? Okay, um, so moving right along. Uh, what could have gone better? So, um, uh, is this, who, who, who is this? Um, that's, Clarence? that's me. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna <laughs> keep stumbling through this. Um, yeah, go for it. Yeah, so the next two items that were added for the what could have gone better, I pulled out of feedback that was heard on this long thread that some folks on this call may have already read through, which is called uh, Deadlines or Horrible. Um, a couple of items that came out of that in terms of feedback was that the enhancements for use deadline was really hard on KEP reviewers, and they felt that they were being overwhelmed with the amount of KEP review needed. And then a second item that came out of that thread was that there's no easy location to find the release calendar. So I think the second one might be actioned on already for 116, since I think there's an outstanding issue for putting it on the uh, main SIG release calendar versus its own separate one. Right. So I sent a I sent an email to KDev as well as everyone who was on the deadlines are horrible email um, that kind of collates all of the action items for that. Um, I think the email subject is uh, some thoughts from SIG PM 
in in code freeze i can find the i can find the thread um but essentially uh yes the the deadline i, I think the, you know the cap the the enhancement freeze thing feeds into the release calendar i recently created a global kubernetes release calendar uh that has been updated in the uh release lead uh handbook so now, instead of creating your own calendar, the release lead should be reaching out to the uh, SIG release chairs to get access, edit access to that calendar and add the items from there, right? And, you know, feel free to put a note of like what release this item is related to. So like 116 code freeze, right? Um, there's also a note to make sure that those items, uh, those events added to the calendar are, have reminders, email reminders for seven days in advance of the, of the, um, the event. Right. So that I think that was the that was the suggestion from the uh, deadlines are horrible thread. So that's been done. Um, I'll formally, I'll more formally announce that I guess outside of the uh, release meeting as a follow up to that. Uh, some thoughts on SIG from SIG PM uh, email. Um, there are a few more action items within that email that I want to wrap up before sending out an update. What was the name of the calendar again? <clears throat> Um, let me pop a link. It's uh, bit.ly bit slash kates dash release dash cal. Okay. So anyone who's on the call who wants to subscribe to that calendar, that's where all release events will be going in future. Got it, got it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I think... Uh, did you talk about the the code freezes? Yes. Sure. Uh, so oh, yeah. the next the next item was also added by me on behalf of uh, Lava Lamp, um, which was the code freeze date was one week after KubeCon EU. This put pressure on SIG leads and PR reviewers, which there was a lot of commentary in Slack around uh, the code freeze date coming right after KubeCon EU being hard. Um, yeah. I don't so, know if anyone else wants yeah. to kind of. So I opened up. Um, so again, in within that sub thoughts from Sig PM email is the fact that KubeCon, uh, uh, you know, the KubeCons were stacked together, and the the KubeCons have been so. Last year we had Shanghai and uh, Seattle stacked, and uh, this year we've had Barcelona and Shanghai stacked. Um, I would. I don't know what the right venue is to propose not having KubeCon stacked like that because I think. This will happen. This will make it like this will happen every uh, like at least one release cycle a year, if we we continue to do that. So Bob has his hand up, and I'll shut up. Qcons uh, for next year are more spaced apart, more evenly. Sweet. Yeah, I believe uh, the EU is at the end of March, beginning of April, and they're yeah they're more evenly spread out. I I will also. I'm not going to get into this discussion now, but I think this adds on to the pile of like, is quarterly too fast to release cadence for Kubernetes? Would we be more capable of absorbing the impact of conferences about more things than just Kubernetes if we had a larger time period to plan? Yeah, and I think that comment was raised by someone in one of these many code freeze coming after EU is hard threads is um, like is quarterly something that every release has to do. Yeah, I um, put so I put in um, the parking lot section um, that that question of is quarterly too fast. Um, so maybe it's something you can pick up at a, at a later, later point since it seems like it might be a bit of a rabbit hole. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's something that feeds into SIG release, and that's something that feeds into working group LTS. I don't want to. I want to make sure that we don't rat hole on this call talking about that. Yep, that sounds good. Um, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I was like typing something out, and then um, just out. Um, all right. So the next one is from Cheryl and Ideal Hack. So, are you there? Yes, that's uh, me and Yang Li. Um, okay. Yeah, so I'll just go ahead and talk about that. Uh, so, um, as you may have known, since uh, 
version 114, uh, shadows that weren't uh, given permissions to do the, you know, to actually do the jobs that um, the branch manager would do. So to compensate for that, the branch manager would, you know, have like a Zoom meeting, share their screen and kind of walk through the process of doing like a release cut. So um, that, you know, as a shadow back then in 114, it feels really um, disconnected. Like you can't really, you know, you you can't do it yourself and you don't know the challenges in getting that set it up. Um, and, you know, the whole process of, it didn't feel tangible, just looking at it uh, from like a Zoom meeting, just, you know, oh, that's how you do it. And then you kind of don't know what questions to ask because it's like a walkthrough. Um, so we're hoping that in 116 that shadows under Yang Li uh, will get permissions so that they could maybe do a release cut for like maybe alpha or like a beta cut. Um, and then they would feel more involved because right now <laughs> it's just more like conveying um, information to shadows and they don't feel as involved as they would like to. So, so. An up yeah, so an update to the group. Um, the branch management role will be moving out of the release team for 116. Branch management role will be part of release managers. Release managers will be composed of the current patch release managers, uh, the branch managers, and associates, right? So associates will be what we consider the shadows today, as well as the Kubernetes build admins. So Kubernetes build admins are the people who have access to actually push the button and package Kubernetes, right? We're going to analyze each of the required permissions for these things. And like one, I will be shadowing for that branch manager position uh, to make sure that I understand exactly what's going on in the flow of this and the required permissions for, um, for each of these roles. We want to make sure that, yes, people have the ability to exercise the permissions that they need to get that job done. But we also re re recognize that it's, it's a job that has very, very high privileges, right? So we want to be careful in who we bring on to the role, who we give permissions, make sure that we have a clear feedback loop also with uh, the product security committee. So I'm going to be cribbing. I'm actually writing the proposal or the PR to switch some of this stuff over. Um, I'm going to be cribbing uh, notes from the product security committee process. Um, because some of these roles require access to uh, some of the secret product security things, right? Like getting access to knowing when CVs are happening and stuff like that, right? That's not branch manager specific, but that is release managers specific, right? So that kind of overarching umbrella, right? So again, release managers will be a separate team that is composed of patch release managers, which have full privileges, branch managers, which have close to full privileges, uh, associates, which are the shadows that are currently applying right now, and then the Kubernetes build admins, who are uh, currently Sumi, um, Sumi, Alexandra, and uh, uh, Linus at uh, Google. Just to just to tack onto that, like the product security committee has something approximating like we we value people who show up and do work for. Uh, three to six months before we consider giving them the full keys to the car, which is not unlike the SIG release shadow process where you shadow for a release cycle before we give you the keys to the car. Um, I completely understand Cheryl's position. I also completely am sympathetic with making very sure we trust who we give the keys to the car. So I think that's a step in the right direction. Yep. For sure. Um, okay. It sounds like we have a, a path forward on that one for now. Um, I think Tim, you have the next one. Yeah. So we we've ended up automating away the test infrastructure role on the release team, but one of the gaps that we have still and that came up a couple times during this release was when the test infrastructure fell over. On the release team side, we were looking at the release blocking test grid, for example, or the, the release 115 test grid data, and we were trying to understand what was going on and was there a problem in Kubernetes or was it the underlying test infrastructure? 
And there were a couple, there was at least one instance where something started seeming wobbly sort of on a Tuesday. And by Friday, we understood that there was a problem. And there may have been multiple things conflated there. But in the meantime, the release team wasn't sure what was going on. Um, I could see a couple of paths forward on this. One, the release lead understanding that it's part of their job to seek that out proactively on behalf of the team. This could also be the CI signal lead doing that much more proactively or also SIG testing, the test infra folks, knowing that the, the release team is going to wonder about these types of things. So basically just we need communication and where there used to be somebody who could have done that and it wasn't necessarily formally part of their role. Now that that most potentially most logical place is not there, we need to make sure that we continue to communicate these things. So um, you're saying that this kind of focus could go into um, the CI signal role, or or is this maybe something we can act like process? Or, yeah, I or think that that's the um, the intent right now. Is as we roll this stuff together, that CI signal would own that. But I I think it will work better if they also have some support or that the um their peers on the test infra side consider that it's beneficial to proactively call out to this person who might be debugging something that they're debugging in parallel. Okay. So if I can, uh, as a chair of SIG testing, um, I, and as an organizer of the Kate Infra Working Group, I'm very interested in moving all of the test infrastructure to a place where the community can more proactively take on a supporting role for this stuff to collectively raise awareness of what's going on. Um, so I think that's one way that we could get some help here. Uh, another way, it's, it's a rabbit hole that myself and Jace have gone down in the past as former release leads, is trying to better codify like effective communication channels for the status of the project and its health. And I'll air quote all of that. Um, because it it's, can be really squishy and, and fuzzy, like what that means and what the hard lines are. Um, but we could, we, I would welcome somebody who wants to like take a crack at that and then help implement it. Because where we landed at the, last, the last couple times was like, there's additional tooling or infrastructure that's kind of needed to help all this out. Um, and so similar to how like discussions about cutting uh, branches and stuff, cutting releases sort of spawned out of the SIG release channel over to release managers, discussions about the operational health of the testing infrastructure sort of broke out of SIG testing over to the testing ops Slack channel. That is by no means like a clear and effective formalized mechanism that will reach everybody. But uh, organically, I do see people sort of show up there and, and ask if things are healthy, uh, which, which could be um, helpful. And then finally, I think where we could also use some help from community members is clear and effective dashboards to help us right. answer these questions without a human even having to be involved. And again, some of this is like engineering effort to like to create those dashboards in the first place, or maybe look at the set of dashboards that exist already and like tweak or tune them to be more uh, actionable rather than a lot of numbers and uh, graphs. So in terms of the clear and effective dashboards, this is still with the like the focus on the the, the infrastructure the, or the testing infrastructure, right? Uh, Good question. Like maybe maybe both. It's un <laughs> it's unclear to me like if part of the confusion over whether it's the tests or it's something else comes from the fact that we don't have clear enough test dashboards, okay. uh, or if we're not getting a strong enough or if we don't have clear dashboards for the health of other things. Okay. So, um, okay. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so one thing to note was that um, the tests on call, uh, the testing on call person was kind of hard to find. Not the person themselves, but the information regarding the person. Like, I, I know that testing ops is the place to go and that there's also like, I think go.kates.io slash test on call or something like that, that will lead you to like the one member do we have or is there a plan to have a mailing list for that? There is a Slack group and they can tag test in front call directly saying at uh, to reach them. Yep. I would, 
So it's not so much about yeah, it's not so much about Slack. It's about also having a mailing group so we can capture this right. information. So yeah. I think that's a great idea as we look to broaden support, as we look to sort of staff an on-call team from community members. But I think in the interim, it's probably most effective if we reduce the number of communication channels that a human being has to be responsive to, uh, which is kind of why using the test infra on call alias is is the recommended path and if that's not documented in the appropriate places we, we should work on that right that the yeah. page you mentioned is a thing that has existed since time eternal so i feel like people who've been on the project for a while are aware of that page as well as another yeah. mechanism to ping a person yeah it was kind of, so I, I think it was like trying to comb through test infra and, and figure out exactly i was like i know this link exists i don't know where it's documented um, the, the reason I suggest the, I, I agree on minimizing communication channels, but the reason I suggest the email, at least as a ping and for the group of people who are on call or even if it's a rotational thing, um, is because we then capture that thread, even if the rest of the channel, even if the rest of the, the communication happens on Slack, at least we've captured, like, this is a problem that the release team is reaching out to, uh, uh test, test, uh, on call for. Um, this is just a suggestion, um, and I know Slack isn't always the best medium for it, but uh, one thing that we do is uh, we have for on-calls, the, the person who's primary, uh, we have it in the, the channel purpose. Um, so we go from uh, whatever the source of truth is, whether it be like a link or something, and um, and then that way like you can go to, uh, what is it, the testing ops Slack channel and, and, and see you know, from there, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And, that, know. and that's, that's in the, the testing ops topic as well. So oh, okay. uh, Got it. yeah, another option could be like opening issues. If we know there are known problems so that people can like link their PRs against issues to be like, I'm having a problem because of this. Again, I feel like this all comes back to if somebody wants to like own and help implement the policy for this, I welcome that. I really do. All suggestions are welcome, but what needs to happen is the work to make those happen. I'll just throw out, I learned a couple of interesting things right here, and I think that if they land in handbooks, that will probably fill a large part of the gap that I had. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've we've been, Tim and I have been reviewing the handbooks, the handbook updates as, they, as they've been coming in the last few weeks, and um, and people are doing that. So I, I, think it's, I think it's fine from the SIG uh, release side, or the release team side specifically. Um, Got it. Um, okay, let's uh, move on just because uh, we have about 20 minutes left. Um, so next up was um, Claire, Tim, and Stephen. Yeah, so this item was that we got a late release blocker from SIG scalability that was discovered on release day. Um, SIG scalability had tests that were failing that they indicated might need to be blocking the release when they actually went through and did a full investigation. They found out that these actually didn't need to block the 115 release and we were able to ship without waiting for a fix for this, but it did cause us to delay the release by about two days. Um, yeah. So I think mostly just calling out that had we had those tests on some blocking on master blocking or one of the main blocking test grids that we look at for SIG release regularly, we would have seen those failures earlier since they'd been starting in late May, I believe. So so one of the things that were mentioned was that um, that the tests cost a lot. And um, I, I totally understand that. I think that we also have the ability to run periodic tests and figure out like what the schedule for periodic tests are if the, you know, if we're saying that tests cost a lot, I'd also like to think about the time that it takes to wrangle people that are on the release team that are responsible for cutting the release, time that's shifted out of their day, like what does that cost, right? I think, I think that being able to turn on a test should be simple enough, right? And we should kind of accept that cost if, if it means that we're going to get a release that's high quality and on time. Uh, um, so, I have a couple comments. Um, first off, the, the reason the tests weren't on the release blocking dashboard is they didn't meet criteria that were put together back in the 
I believe 113 or 112 time frame about what what uh, what qualities should a job have to be considered release blocking. Uh, and some of these include the amount of time it takes for the job to run, the frequency with which it is run, its pass rate, the responsiveness of the people who own the job, and things of that nature. And so that a decision was made to move jobs that don't meet that criteria over to a port called informing. So this way, when we look at the release blocking board, like it is expected to be mostly green all the time. And if it is red, that's a big problem. Because the state of things was that scalability yeah. tests took a very long time to run and were often red for the majority of the release cycle, which taught us to be numb to the release blocking dashboard as a whole with all of its jobs being red. The situation we are in today is there's a release informing dashboard where the scalability jobs live. And now that's read all the time. And we've become numb to that being read all the time. Um, there are a number of jobs in that dashboard that probably don't even meet the criteria to be there. Um, I will take some mea culpa for not actively engaging to continue like shuffling uh, test jobs around. But like I said, Marie has certainly taken the lead on that and we would welcome help from other people to sort of help groom uh, tests that do or do not meet these criteria. Um, I think that's, that's my main comment uh, for here. Uh, oh, wait, second comment would be SIG scalability has been a thorn in every single release lead's life at the very end of the release cycle. Happens every time. Yeah, I think um, from the, well, from the previous meeting, um, that might be something we put in the parking lot for now um, because, yeah, that might be a bit of a, a rabbit hole. But um, yeah. So, yeah, so just to, to call out to your, um, your, your uh, criteria for release blocking and the fact that one of them is the responsiveness of the the test owners right so I will I will leave that in the air and uh, let us move on I will note and try to see if we can in sig release get a follow-on retrospective of this particular set of issues with sig um, scalability in an ongoing conversation yeah plus one because uh the folks from sig scalability weren't able to be here today so it feels weird to go into a rabbit hole about them without them present absolutely i i will say for the recording that the core issue is that sig scalability is understaffed hmm. and it's pretty much always been understaffed and and it may be time for us to start putting pressure on some of the supporting companies to like maybe even hire somebody that we can put on scalability. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I put that one in the in the parking lot, and Tim, I signed the action um, for you to set up the uh, follow up meeting on that. Um, in terms of the test criteria, was there any any action items or things you said? I think someone said Maria was was refactoring some of the, some of the things, but. Yeah you can put an AI on me for helping measure and enforce the remainder of the criteria. So we do actually enforce that there are owners now, things we could use help to improve the measurement of and then sort of gate or alert on are the criteria around the job duration, the frequency, the flake rate, the tests. And then we still don't have a clear and effective way to measure responsiveness of people when their jobs fail. And the proxy that we use is how long does it take the job to go from red to green? And this is all kind of done anecdotally by humans who, when they experience enough pain, will get cranky and go look at these things and decide if they should move it out. What, what yeah. would be super helpful is continued implementation of a robot that does these things. Yep. Yeah, of course. Um, great. I signed that to you. I, uh, I probably wrote it wrong because I'm like, yeah, but um, you can just edit it, whatever. Um, okay. Uh, next one, Josh. Yep. Where are we here? Oh, right. Um, so um, I've been actively involved in the various KubeCons, and I had even less time than I expected to check on shadow status um, in the middle four weeks of the release, um, which meant that I missed some things in terms of people um, kind of falling off of active participation. Um, and the answer to that's probably going to be um, a combination of, I mean, next release will be more available, but also that maybe we should look at having, if EA is going to be a permanent role, 
having also an EA shadow um, so that we can alternate coverage. So I, I think the, I, I agree with having the coverage. I don't think that we need to call them shadows as they're coming in as former release team leads, essentially. In EA team then. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Semantics. <laughs> all right, great. Uh, all right, next up is, one second, lost my place. Um, uh, I do not know <laughs> STT, a TS, <laughs> who is this? So that's, uh, that's um, so the person who submitted this, I think is Andre Martin and the, uh, the people involved are uh, Stefan Schminski and uh, Nikita. Got it. But I'm not or, sure if yeah. any of them are on the I, call. Andre mentioned to me he wasn't able to join at this time slot. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll just read it off then. Um, there was a single RC in Kubernetes, Kubernetes repo, but zero RCs in all other repos. Um, I know that they were fixing the publishing bot so that all other repos would have this RC tag. The R RCs on all repos are important for us since once they are created, it is when we bump our Go libraries and perform some tests in RCI. The fact that all of the repos were not published with the a RC tag should have been a release block IMO. So, anyone have any thoughts on that one? Um, I'd be curious about the context. Is is he speaking as a consumer of Kubernetes or a contributor to Kubernetes? Um, mm -hmm. Because you know, if if it's a if it's a staffing thing, like PR is welcome, contribution welcome, kind of thing. I I feel like. Um... It's a, it's a concern that being unable to cut, yeah, release candidate tags on all of our, all of the repos that live in staging are actually starting to be consumed by pieces of this project that are also mm -hmm. trying to go out the door. Um, and so it, this is similar to how like Kube ADM gets really cranky when uh, release candidate Debian packages aren't cut, right? Um, I do feel like we should have a discussion about this being a release blocker. In terms of the technical implementation, I will again welcome anybody who wants to show up to the Kate Center Working Group where Nikita and Steven are uh, working to get the publishing bot up and running over there and would welcome contributors who want to help build and maintain the bot to make sure that it does all of these great wonderful things. And I can like a tracking issue and action items. Yeah, so that would be good. Just, just mm -hmm. noting it's, it's Stefan and not me. Um, Sorry, Stefan, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah, great. Um, moving along, because we've got 12 minutes. Um, uh, Jeff, I believe this is you. Yep. Um, so we ran into something interesting uh, literally this morning. Uh, we noticed that some of the uh, themes on the blog had no release notes related to them. Um, and it turns out that there were not actually any release notes in the PRs, but the you know functional work was done, so it got a theme. Um, it might have been nice, or we might have been able to catch us if we had gotten the uh, themes or worked with comms a little bit more, but that, that's ultimately the problem. Uh, there was a disconnect between themes and release notes, and we need to be a bit more proactive about that. Okay. So, um, moving on, uh, only Dole. Yes, I uh, got it right. Uh, so, so kind of, kind of off, off that same topic. Also related to the caps is the is that want for uh, we we had a meeting with the uh, with release notes with the sig leads with you know with docs and then we were really able to understand what the themes were better. The unfortunate thing is that we met a little bit later on in the cycle. Uh, so really just calling out would be a lot more helpful to have that earlier on in the cycle, talk with the SIG leads and understand what features and themes and, and kind of what are the important things that we are going to focus on within this release. And then that will lead the way and help our progress throughout the rest of the release cycle. So definitely, definitely a plus one on those fronts. Okay. So thing there is uh, just meeting earlier. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. If, if we made that like a formal thing, we add that to the schedule and then just kind of front loaded that, that would be really helpful ultimately. I had a 
quick question on that regard. Um, I feel like what I perceived happened in certainly the 113 and 114 release cycles was like the lead and the feature, the release lead and the feature person sort of went out and talked to a bunch of different SIGs in person at their meetings to sort of remind them that like caps were coming and to get their features put together, but also to get an impression of like what's really important to you, what matters. Did that happen this time around? So we didn't go to every single SIG meeting, but we did reach out to all the SIGs who had enhancements that were slated to land in 115 um, in some way, whether that was over Slack or another another medium. So we did reach out to all of them to get their feedback. I think in part because of KubeCon, a lot of that, there was some latency getting all of that assembled since when we started doing it, they were all very much focused on KubeCon mode. And I was ready to present kind of the themes that are release team of what looked like it was landing. And then at the last minute, a bunch of things didn't make the release. And I felt like we had to scramble, you know, mm -hmm. like to me, the, the themes earlier, like before the freeze and after freeze ended up being totally different because, you know, I was like, oh, okay, it's obviously going to be these three major things. And then the Friday before everything was due, it was like, hey, they didn't make it. It was like, uh-oh. So yeah, I, 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 think, I felt like we went from not much to do to like, uh oh, we need to find themes. <laughs> yeah, I mean this goes this goes into like SIGs. I so that email thread that I linked a little higher up suggests SIGs doing planning sessions, right, around code freeze for every cycle, right? Getting an idea of what their themes are going to be before we start the cycle. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is the enhancements that exist right now, after enhancements goes in and kind of checks this stuff out, what ends up happening is like 25 to 40% of that stuff drops from the release, right? So like the themes will always change and they will always be a moving target until we have planning, so until we have planning ahead of the, the cycle, so. You got Tim raising his hand. I think Aaron was first. Aaron. Um, Let's go. I, I agree with what Stephen was saying. Uh, I think that runs into the sort of split brain problem that the release lead runs into where you have like the release lead focused on getting things out the door, just like the SIG is focused on getting things out the door. But you also need like somebody else focused on the next uh, the next cycle. In. Um, the Something that we tried in the past and is the entire reason the comms role exists was to try and like by the time feature freeze happens, write a draft blog post. So that, boom, there's our guess of the themes right there. I was then told that this was perceived as a bad idea because some publications out there picked that up as a promise of what we will do and not a best effort, best guess forecast. And that led some people to be disappointed. But I still feel like the entire reason we had enhancements freeze or feature freeze in the first place was to give us that checkpoint to like looking at what we have, distill the themes and get some feedback on whether that's appropriate or not. Yeah. So I, I actually tried to cheat. You know, I told Taylor, I was like, Hey man, I think I've written the blog post already. We got plenty of time and I ended up not using 90% of it. So I, the, I was like, don't waste your time. <laughs> we, could have, we've, we could have just prepared better to sprint at the end. I think, I don't, I don't know. I, other than yeah. chasing people earlier and trying to be more aggressive, chasing people down, which was tough. Some, some people were just like, I just got out of KubeCon. I don't really know what day, you know? So I, yeah, it's, it's a tough problem to solve. We're just going to have to keep chasing people. I was yeah. going to mention basically that the calendar, I think hit us slightly weird on this release cycle. The, um, cause we, we are trying to treat this as a continuum. The, the shadows we tried to call out for on with, with Claire, to collect themes around enhancements and double check on themes ahead of and after code freeze as well. So there were like kind of every three or four weeks, some, some check-ins with the SIGs on the key things. And more often than not, a lot of them were like, ah, KubeCon, ah, holiday. It was the, the calendar slammed us somehow, but I, I feel like we have the checkpoints, but I don't know. I'd be curious to see how it goes in the next cycle. Just if, exactly what we did this time worked better because the calendar. Yeah. Um, okay. I think um, so we have five minutes left. Um, we have to still get into what we did differently. So um, Claire, do you want to go? Yeah, this one will be real short and sweet because we've basically already started doing it, but the test info role no longer 
feels that it's super needed now that we've added automation and all the remaining tasks are going to be absorbed by the branch manager role and then test infra on call. So we no longer need a test infra on the release team. Cool. So is there any like documentation that needs to be updated around that or? There's still, I think, a couple of outstanding PRs, but nothing that we need to add that's not already in flight, to my knowledge. Okay. Yeah, it's all it's all either merged or in progress, in review progress. So. Cool, great. Um, all right, who's up next? Castro. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. I've already filed the ticket, just linking up Paris and Lachlan. We're just got to automate uh, posting all the videos on YouTube so release leads don't have to do any of that. Okay, and that's already... Uh, it's already in, in flight. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Lockie, um, do you think we can nail yours in the time that we have left or should we hold it? Uh, this one's pretty easy, this next one. But basically there were just seemingly unnecessary binary argument changes. So as a distribution owner, not as a release team member, basically a whole bunch of crap broke. Um, you know, Hypercube removed the word cube dash from all their images and allow privilege got set to true and the flag got removed in, in Kubler. So just, and there's no mention of that in the release notes too. If somebody could find that, I'd be happy to see it. But just as a, as a distribution owner, these kind of things, I don't know why those decisions were made. Hopefully somebody had a good reason, but when you're maintaining a distribution, it's kind of like, why the heck, why, the, why is that important? Those sorts of things would should fall under our deprecation policy that we use for versioned APIs. We treat flags similarly, and so we missed something here, and we should figure out. I'm pretty sure the uh, Hypercube stuff specifically have been deprecated for a long time, but it should have still been in release notes. Yeah, so it's a question of like, Actually, was we caught it in alpha, so we could catch it, clean it up. We just put it in here then. It's a question of like, did it, did was sufficient notice given, um, and then uh, at the time that we decided it was deprecated, which gives you a lead time to uh, deal with it, and then we should have called this out very specifically within a deprecation section of the release notes. So I would be interested to understand where the ball was dropped along the way, but that's a very valid concern. Yeah. City. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, it'd be good to just have like a flag section like right up there at the top because there are some other cases where features were moved from alpha to beta and added on by default. One of them was around, um, I believe it was, uh, I can't remember, it was device manager resource counting, which broke on Windows. And so we were able to we were respond and catch that in testing, which wasn't a problem. It was just kind of a surprise that it was, you know, something that was reactive rather than understanding that, oh, hey, this new flag is now going to be required versus optional, and there is no way for an average user to understand before it happened. Got it. And there's a there's a deprecation section in the release notes that was just missed. Well, that's like, in the example I'm giving you, it was a promotion from alpha to beta, which turned it on by default. It's not a deprecate. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite. Oh, oh, okay, got it, got it. Um, okay. We got a link in the notes. Got it, that sounds good, thank you. Um, all right, we have one minute left, so I'll pause here. Um, I can pick this back up at another point. Um, maybe, is it usually in the, the next SIG release meeting? Right? Um, uh, so, um, I'll make a note here. Does anyone have any questions, or, or not questions, uh, any other thoughts? <laughs> Corey? close the call. Uh, Christine, you did an amazing job moderating this. Uh, we uh, historically have not even gotten to the what we will do better section in the community oh. meeting portion of the retro, so great job. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, well, I'm excited to be here. So, um, Anything else? Thank you, everyone, for showing up and giving your opinions and all that good stuff. And thank you for your hard work in 115. I know it was a, a slog towards the end. So thank you for, for that. Yeah, and thanks, Christine, for chairing the retro. Yeah, yeah. of course, thank you. <laughs> all right, uh, thanks everyone. I have to go run another retro now, so I'll <laughs> see you later. Happy Bye. Bye. Bye.